Welcome back to our series on rose and perfumery. So if you've already been watching to this point in the series, you probably know that this is our series about rose where we take a deep dive into rose and perfumery. And we've already spent a lot of time looking at the constituent raw materials inside of rose. And now we're trying to blend them into an accord. So in the last video, we made some basic rose accords. Firstly, we made a simple one with just phenylethyl alcohol, citronella, and geranial. And then we also moved on to some variations on those and some basic accords which were found in a book. In this video, I'm going to bring the rose accord to completion by first choosing the best of what we had before, and then also testing out some other of the raw materials that we covered before but haven't tried out in the blends yet, and arrive at a final rose accord. So if you're interested in making and customizing your own rose accord, definitely follow along with the processes in this video. Feel free to substitute the raw materials that I'm using with your own if you feel like it. And of course, at the end of the video, I'll give you the final formula for the rose accord that I make. So with all that said, let's get into it. Okay then, so let's get straight into it, and I'm going to begin with the iteration that I made after the series of variations I made for my basic rose accord last time. So last time we did A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and in doing that we tested out the Nerol, Rose Oxide, Farnesol, Aldehydes, Phenyl uh, Constituents, Damascones, and Ionones. And what I remember from that series of experiments was I didn't like the Nerol so much. I thought the Rose Oxide was really good, so I kept the Rose Oxide in this blend, I also really like the Farnesol, so I kept that in this blend as well. The aldehydes I wasn't sure about yet, and I felt they were too strong, or that aldehyde C9, which was the one I used at the level it was used in the last formula, it was too strong, so I omitted it for now. And the phenyl constituents, I didn't really think they were that great, so I again left them out. Then for the Damascones, I decided to add two of the Damascones actually. I added equal parts of both alpha and beta damascone, not just the beta damascone that I tried last time. However, I also reduced the amount of both of them in order to make sure that it would come under the IFRA limit so that it's, um, I guess, safe to use. Then finally for the ionones, last time I decided to use alpha and beta ionone, but this time for this next iteration, I decided just to stick to the alpha ionone because I think I preferred the smell of that. I also felt in that last blend that the ionones were quite prominent, so I decided to not increase the amount of ionones, but actually just leave it at a small 0.05% in the final formula. So when you put all of that together, you get this new formula that I made called RO3, and I'll put it up on the screen so you guys can see it. And when I smelt this formula for the first time, I basically um, remember thinking that actually I think this is really nice, and I think this is quite a balanced rose accord. To be honest, I actually felt like I could have stopped there. So I think um, this, these elements all together, they really kind of add a lot to it compared to that simple rose accord that I made before. That one's a bit rough around the edges, a little bit sharp, but this is just so much more kind of full and radiant and that rose smell is really nicely all blended together. I don't think any one of the individual elements sticks out particularly and I just think it does smell like a rose kind of smell. Maybe not the most eloquent, uh, professional, perfect rose ever, but to me, it does a really good job of smelling like a rose. So especially if you wanted a rose accord on a budget, then I think this is already more than fine. So next, building off of the success of that blend, I thought I would continue a bit further and try to introduce some of those ideas from that introduction to perfumery formula that we had. And if you remember from the last video, I quite like the one with the geranyl acetate and the eugenol. So I thought, Let's uh, experiment just for now with the geranyl acetate, which I thought would add some kind of sweetness and see what happens there. So I made this new formula and I added geranyl acetate, but I also added some other acetates because I thought maybe they would kind of all blend together. So I added neryl acetate as well and phenyl ethyl acetate. So I've gonna made that here. Now, to be honest, as soon as I smelled this formula, I was actually quite disappointed. And that's because I genuinely think it just simply makes it worse and I don't think it actually works. So I can definitely smell all of those acetate things being there, but I don't think it actually helps the rose. It actually brings it away from smelling like a rose, and if you were to give this to me, I wouldn't quite so naturally land on the fact that it's a rose smell anymore. I think um, all of these acetate things, which aren't necessarily found in the rose, or at least not at high amounts, I think it starts to kind of pull the rose away from its natural smell, which does kind of make sense. Anyway, to me, it does put a slight harsher edge on the rose and it makes it maybe a bit more synthetic or chemically kind of smelling very slightly. And 
While I do kind of get that sweetness from the acetates there, it doesn't blend into the rose in the way that I thought it would. So after doing this blend, I decided that those acetates were a bit of a failure and I didn't want to continue with those in any of the future blends. So at this point, I decided to go back to that third iteration, that RO3 blend, and use that as the base to actually go and test out some more single raw materials on their own to see how they combine with that base, to see what effect they give to the blend overall, and then maybe decide to do what we did before, which was take all of those variations from iteration two and then use those together to make an iteration three. So I thought, let's go and repeat that process. So what I did was six different trials this time, and I did one with aldehyde C9, so that's what we did before, but this time at a much lower concentration to see what the effect would be like at a smaller level. Now we hadn't done any of the other aldehydes, and I remember quite liking the smell of the aldehyde C12 lauric, because that gave me a bit of a kind of bright fizzy smell. So I thought, let's go and try that one as well. Then I also thought, okay, how about the geronyl acetate on its own and just under much lower concentration to see if maybe that works and maybe it was just the phenylethyl acetate or the narrow acetate in that other blend that was making it bad. So I tried that again. And then also the eugenol and I was careful to put just a very small amount of eugenol because I know how strong that is. And I was thinking, I wonder what effect that has on the rose because usually when you add eugenol to a blend, it is quite noticeable. Then finally, I also thought we could add some of those other interesting miscellaneous materials we covered in the final video on the raw materials. And I decided to add peonyl, that peony molecule, and rosafen, that rose molecule, just to see what effect they would also have on the blend. So let's start then with the addition with the aldehyde C9. And in this version, the final percentage of the aldehyde C9 is now only 0.02%, so it is really quite low. Now when I go to smell that, Immediately, it smells much closer to that RO3 base that we made before. I don't get a massive dose of aldehyde jumping out me anymore. At the same time, I think if I really, really try to detect it, I can just about pick it up. And I find it hard to kind of quite realize if I guess the effect is an improvement or not. But one thing I did notice was after a little while, that aldehyde C9 does become just a little bit more prominent. And I do think it still left a bit of that waxy orange peel smell. So I did feel like this, it wasn't necessarily bad, but I don't think it was quite what I wanted for the Accord. So next we have the E5B version, which was the one with the aldehyde C12 lauric. Now again, I used the same concentration with the C9, assuming that the things would be quite similar in strength. And again, this one was also very subtle. I think this one was even less noticeable than the effect of the aldehyde C9. That said, however, when I smelled this one, I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but there was something about it which I just seemed to, I don't know, I just seemed to kind of gravitate towards it slightly. So for that reason, I did decide to keep this aldehyde C12 lauric in the next blend. So we'll see that in a moment. But firstly, let's move on to the other things we tried here. And the next one is the journal acetate for the second time. So this one I use a much smaller dose of the geronyl acetate, but when I go to smell it, I still get that kind of acetate vibe, I still kind of get that, um, that kind of smell which I just don't think quite fits into my kind of image of the rose and how I want it. I can't quite put my finger on it or it's hard to describe what it is, but it, it adds this slight kind of harshness or this slight dissonance um, and this kind of slight unnaturalness. And it's not that I think journal acetate couldn't be used in a rose, I just think it's not pulling it in a direction that I want it to be pulled in as such, as in I just kind of prefer how it was before. So again, I decided not to carry that one forward. Then next we have eugenol, and I think the one with eugenol was really quite interesting. So with the eugenol, what you immediately notice is that kind of slightly dark, spicy, maybe almost nutty side of the rose, the one that you especially notice in the real damask rose oil, I really think that starts to come through in a way that didn't come through before. It kind of adds this um, this kind of depth, but more of a kind of, um, I would say a much darker kind of warm um, kind of facet to the rose. It's something that contrasts a bit with that light airiness of the petals, which is mostly what I've been kind of emphasizing so far with the blend that I've gone for. And I do quite like the effect of this. I don't want it too strong because I don't want to make my rose completely that kind of rose for this thing, but I still want to have a slight touch of that in there 
just to kind of give just a little bit more naturalness, a bit more realism, and also provide just a slight, slight, slight kind of tint to the rose and a second layer to it. So I did decide to keep the Eugenol for the second blend as well. Okay, so now we're moving on to the two final aroma chemicals, which kind of smelled like rose, but aren't actually found in rose, which I'm trialing with these blends. So the first one was Peonile, and that one kind of had this kind of soft, slightly petal-like scent, and I thought that one might uh, kind of contribute or it might add a bit to the rose. I wasn't too sure, so I thought I would just try it. I didn't try the Piamosa because that one smelled a bit more stemmy, a bit closer to the phenylethyl acetate. And I'd already tried the phenylethyl acetate in the previous blend. And if you remember, that one didn't turn out so good. So I thought maybe the Piamosa would be a decent one to try. So with this one, it definitely hasn't added anything bad to the rose. It simply seems to have overlaid the kind of smell of the penile as it was before above the smell of the rose. It just has added that essentially over the top of it. And I'm quite agnostic or apathetic towards it. I don't really think it's necessarily good or bad, um, but I don't really see a reason to add it because I don't think it's emphasizing anything. And by not emphasizing anything, it's adding to the complexity of the formula and that always creates a potential problem in the future that maybe that thing doesn't blend with something in the future, and then you don't quite know why something's not working. So where possible, I think it's good to stay kind of with something simple. So for that reason, I think I'm not actually going to continue that in the final accord. Then finally, we have the one with the Rosafen. Now, the Rosafen, I do think, is something that's quite subtle, even at the higher concentrations. However, when I smelled this blend, Again, I wasn't too sure what it was about it, but it just smelled more full and round. So there's something about the Rosafen. It just seems to kind of bring the rose together and link it up a little bit. I don't think this is truly necessary, but I felt like the effect was overall positive. So I did think it was worth kind of keeping this one in the Accord. I think it just adds a little bit of sweetness, maybe. It just kind of makes it pop out a little bit more. Um, it just makes it a little bit more fun. I, I don't know how if that describes it. It also adds maybe the slightest kind of tea-like nuance, and I think that would probably blend quite well with the eugenol or the slightly darker side as well. Though overall, I think it adds more of kind of a sweet, playful fruitiness to the rose, and that is generally the direction I want to go in with this accord, so um, I did also keep this one for the next iteration. Okay, so at this point my intention was to do one final blend where I took the best elements out of that series of trials and just added them all into one final accord. So that is what I started by doing. I added that eugenol, aldehyde C12 lauric, and the rosafen, so the three which I thought genuinely had some kind of positive effect, even if quite small, and added all of those to the formula. But then I thought, hang on a minute, what about that rose oxide? Because I remember that was something that had a really big impact on the blend, and even though in natural roses it's found in a very small amount, and thus I added it at a very small amount into my accord, I wonder if overdosing that would actually improve the smell of the rose. So at that point I decided to do another blend where everything else was the same, but I also added some more rose oxide. So I essentially tripled the amount of rose oxide. Then, after I decided to do that, I also had another thought, which was, what about the geranyl formate? Because we tried the geranyl acetate, but I remember the geranyl formate was a bit more kind of fruity, berry, lychee, that kind of direction, and that is pretty much the direction I wanted to go in in the first place with this accord anyway. So I thought, how about just do that as another trial? I'd already almost finished making the blends at that point, so I couldn't be bothered to do another one, even though technically that's what I should have done to test that theory. So in the end, I just decided to add the geranol formate to the first blend with the idea that overall, with both blends, I could tell if it was better or worse than the third iteration that I tried, and then the difference between those two blends would work out which of the improvements were better. So I went and tried these two blends, and I must say that the difference between them is very, very small. I was quite conservative with the amount of geranol formate, having learned from the effect of the geranol acetate. So I guess the first question is, is either of them better than the rose 3? So we've got that rose 3 back here, and then if I go and smell this new RO6A next to it, I do think they are pretty close, so there's not a very, very clear winner. I think that either of them are pretty good, but I do think I prefer this new version slightly. 
I just think it does have a little bit of extra depth. I think you can tell the effect that those things, like the Eugenol, the Aldehyde C12, and the Rosafen are having. And I also think that that slight kind of twist from the Geronyl Acetate, I think that does add something, and I think it's worth keeping. So I decided I did quite like that blend. Then between those two with the addition of a bit more Rose Oxide, to me, I don't think it necessarily improved it. You can notice it, I think, but it just does bring out the smell of Rose Oxide on its own a bit more. The thing about the Rose Oxide, though, is it's not its own distinctive smell which was really making the rose pop, it was the effect it had on the blend. So by adding more Rose Oxide, it doesn't seem to have increased the Accord effect that it was giving. It just seems to have started to add a baseline smell of Rose Oxide. So for that reason, I thought, I guess this isn't really necessary to have a higher level of Rose Oxide. Again, I don't think it makes the thing worse, so I wouldn't be against having this. And then, looking at all of this stuff, um, from what I can see, really I think that RO3 Accord is most of the way there. I think it's got most of the elements, and these final variations are just kind of almost examples of how you might wish to tune that Accord to your liking. So in this case, I think I quite like this 6A version, just with that slight unusuality coming from that Geronil Formate, and what I think is it's just been developed a little bit in a certain direction that I'm kind of feeling like essentially at the moment. That said, it's still very close to the RO3 base, so if you were looking for something very, very generic, then I think that would be absolutely fine too. So this was the Rose Accord. You could either take it as RO3 as a final formula or the RO6A, depending on what you feel like at the moment. And with that, I think this is going to be the end of the Rose Accord segment. So overall, I'm really happy with all that I've learned from doing this blending. The final thing that I really want to do with this series and in terms of improving my own knowledge and learning is start to learn how the rose affects other blends in perfumery. So I'm hoping to do one final episode, which is where I take the rose accord that I've just made, also take the real rose oil maybe, or one of the rose bases, and start adding them to things, uh, simple kind of mixtures that you might find yourself using all the time in perfumery. So basic structures like the Groschman Accord, and then common raw materials, things like Ambroxan or Musks or Vanillin, things like that, things that you'd really commonly find, probably things like Bergamot, that would be another one, and just seeing the effect that those things have together with the rose, and then maybe even making just some very basic perfume and seeing the effect of how it evolves with the rose and how it evolves without the rose. So the effect that the actual rose is having on the composition. So that is what I want to do in the next video. I don't know when I'll get that out, but hopefully quite soon. But yeah, until then, hopefully you guys can have some fun making your own rose accords. Hopefully you can gain some insights or some bits of knowledge about my experiments making the rose accord. And if you find any other things that I haven't thought about or things that I didn't cover in my experiments with the rose accord, please do let me know down in the comments. I'll be really interested to hear what I missed out because obviously there's so many things you can try and you never have time to try them all. So until then, have a great week and I'll see you next time.